Okay, so today we're going to discuss uh, about two important topics in algorithm design. So we're not talking about any particular data structure or algorithm, rather we are talking about a very important technique, like two of the most important techniques in algorithm design. So first of all, recursion. I think already we have solved problems using recursion, but let's uh, still, we want to formally define it and also revisit it because after talking about recursion, we are going to talk about dynamic programming, which helps in solving recursive problems in many ways. So first of all, what is recursion? Okay. So we know that sometimes the best way to solve a problem is by solving the smaller version of the same exact problem. For example, if someone asks you that uh, what is the best way to go from, say, uh, Dallas to, someone asks you what is the best way to, to visit, uh, like travel between Dallas to San Antonio, okay? Now you know that uh, you have to go to San Antonio through Austin, right? So you can break this problem down. And then if you can find this smaller sub problem, you can ask this question, what is the most op optimized way to travel between Dallas to Austin? And then you again ask the question, what is the optimized way to uh, travel between from Austin to San Antonio? And then you can combine them and get your whole solution, right? Okay, so recursion is, is a technique. It's a technique that solves the problem by solving a smaller problem of the same type. So you break down your problem into smaller ones and, and then solve the exact same problem on the smaller set and combine them and then get the, result for the bigger one. So if you remember, we had done this thing, like if you remember the pre-order DFS pre-order algorithm, right? So if you remember the DFS, so we did it on a tree, right? So suppose this was the tree. We wanted to visit this, like traverse it yeah, using a pre-order method. So what we did it, is we started here, right? So we started DFS with root. And then what we did is we first visited like the root because this is pre-order. So we have to visit the root first. And then what we did is we again called DFS on the left subtree. Right? And then we call DFS on the right subtree. So you see that this is an, here actually we have called this DFS function recursively. So we have called DFS inside DFS. And so this is a bigger problem. You can think this is the bigger problem. And then we break it down into smaller ones the exact same problem, right? Because we can think that this is also a tree. This is also a tree. These two are also trees, right? But these two trees were like part of the bigger tree. So if we call DFS on each of them, and then we can use this problem to solve the DFS of the bigger one, right? So, so that's, there goes the definition of the recursion. Recursion is a technique that solves the problem by solving a smaller problem of the same type. Okay, so let's talk about a real life exercise or example. Uh, suppose uh, students have formed a queue or, or a line or a column uh, in the classroom. They have, they have formed a column. Now, someone in the front, he wants to know uh, Let's say it's not in the classroom, in an open open space or something. 
uh, a group of students have formed a column or queue. So someone in the front wants to know that how many students are standing in the column, but he cannot move from there. Just think about this. He, he cannot move. He can just, and also he doesn't have such powerful vision to look all the way uh, behind and count. So what he can do is, now he has a problem. He wants to uh, know that how many students are actually standing in the queue. So what he can do is he can ask the person next to him. So there is a person here, right? Standing here. There's a person here. He can just ask him or her, right? So suppose this was the person in the front. He can ask the person behind him, hey, do you know how many uh, people are standing in the queue? Now, this, pro this person also has the same problem, you see. She also doesn't know how many uh, are behind her. She asks the next person behind her, right? So it keep, uh, keeps on going and going. Okay, now two things. You see that everyone is actually, this person has uh, the problem. His problem is the length of the, say, length of the queue, right? He had this problem. Now he passed this problem uh, to the next person. Next person now again has the same problem, like length of the queue. Every You, you keep on passing the same problem. But the problem becomes smaller, you see that? So this is a larger problem. And as you send it behind, it, it becomes like smaller. So you can think it as a real life recursive call. Okay, so you, you call the, like you made a recursive call. Now, how do you get your result? The result you get is if this person finally tells you that, hey, they're like in, uh, minus one people behind me. Then you can, what you can do is you can use this result and add yourself so in minus one plus, in minus one plus one, okay? So this is the final result. Similarly, this person actually got this result in minus two, this person told this, suppose it said, or let's leave in if it, so someone said like, hey, there were like 52 people behind me. So I can get this result and add one and say, oh, okay, there are 53 people including me in the line, okay? Okay, so one important thing is from once you do the recursive call and once you get the result from the smaller problems, you have to know a way to combine, combine the result from the smaller problem. get the result for the larger problem, okay? That's one thing. And the second thing is this recursion call uh, cannot go on forever, right? Can I just keep on asking like forever? Actually, there is someone who doesn't have any person behind him or her, right? So that person suppose is here. That person says, oh, okay, you see, there is zero people behind me. That is called the base case. So any recursion should have this base case. Okay, so this is a base case. So any recursive algorithm should have this base case where at least one person start saying, oh, I know the answer. And then he passes the answer to someone else. He now recreates his own answer. Okay, so there must be a base case where the recursion stops. Okay. Okay, so recursion, every recurs recursive algorithm involves at least two cases. One is a base case. A base case means a simple occurrence that can be answered directly, right? Because the last person, he didn't need to ask someone else. He knows the answer. Oh, there is nobody behind me. Okay, so this is a simple occurrence that can be answered directly without asking anyone. And the recursive case, which is the complex occurrence of the problem that cannot be answered directly, right? So these calls were like recursive. When I asked her, hey, how many people were, are behind us? She doesn't know the answer. She had to ask someone else, right? 
and this person also had to ask someone else. So this is these calls are the recursive calls. And this person is the base case. Once he asked him, he doesn't need to ask anyone. He knows the answer. Okay. Okay, some recursive algorithms can have more than one base case or recursive case. We will show them. Uh, but all algorithms have at least one base case. That's the crucial part. So in the crucial part of recursive programming is identifying those cases. Okay, if I go back and ask you, like, what was the uh, base case for these algorithms? This was also a recursive algorithm. So here was the base case. At the beginning, you should say, if this node, right? If this node is equals to equals to null, they'll, then I return, right? So that was the base case. You see, there is null here. There is null here, right? So once the DFS was called on this, it returned, it no longer went behind. So in our case, we modified the algorithm and added this base case. This is at the beginning of the algorithm, right? Okay. So that was the base case and these were the recursive cases. And you see these algorithm can actually combine these recursive cases to get the final or final solution. Okay, so let's talk about uh, an, a recursive, an algorithm that can be solved recursively. So, so n factorial, I think you, all of you, since you're in computer science, um, or even if you're not, you have, you know what n factorial is, right? So n factorial is uh, n into n minus one into n minus two, right? Up to one. Right, this is the n factorial. Now, can we say that n factorial can be written as what is this part? Can I say that this is n minus one factorial? Right, can I say that n factorial is actually n into n minus one factorial? Now, can we say that we actually have a bigger, larger problem and then we we are solving it using a smaller problem of the same same problem of a smaller size. So if I know n minus one factorial, I can calculate n factorial. I can further break it down. Like n minus one factorial can be solved by n minus one into n minus two factorial, right? Okay. So that means I have been able to create a recursive case. So, so to turn it into a uh, recursive algorithm, we need a base case, right? What is the base case? So the base case is zero factorial. Okay, so once it reaches zero, then the value becomes one. And we can write one factorial as, so one factorial is one into n minus one factorial, that is zero factorial, okay? That is one into one. So one factorial is also one. Okay, so we can define it now that n factorial is one. That is the base case. And this is a closed form definition. We can just make it recursive like this. So this is the recursive solution for this, okay? So we write this portion as n minus one factorial into n. Okay, so let's talk about another recursive problem. This is called as Fibonacci number or Fib some call it Fibonacci. Yes, whatever it is. So the base case for this problem is we know the fib zeroth Fibonacci number is uh, zero and first Fibonacci number is one okay so the second Fibonacci number is is the sum of these two the previous two so the second Fibonacci number is two the third one is the sum of the previous two 
which is 2 plus 1, 3. Next one is 3 plus 2, 5. Next one is 5 plus 3, 8. Next one is 8 plus 5, 13. Okay. Next one is 13 plus 8, 21. Okay. So we see this can be defined recursively. So the zeros Fibonacci or Fibonacci number is 0. First Fibonacci number is 1. So we can define any, say, nth Fibonacci number as a summation of the n minus 1 Fibonacci number plus n minus 2 Fibonacci number. If n is greater than or equals to 2. So we take the summation of the previous two Fibonacci numbers to get the current Fibonacci number. And this is the recursive case. And this is the base case. We have two base cases here. Okay, so if I draw it like a draw the function calls like a tree, it will look like this. So for Fibonacci number of n, it will make two calls, uh, Fibonacci of n minus one and Fibonacci of n minus two. It will make these two calls, okay? And then it will, it will add them up. Okay, so you see that Fibonacci of n is breaks down into two smaller problems, right? Similarly, Fibonacci of n minus one again breaks down into two smaller portions or two smaller calls, right? It will call Fibonacci of n minus two and Fibonacci of n minus three, and then it will add them up. Similarly, this one will also break down into two. So it will keep on going until we reach say f of one or f of zero. So until we reach there, it will keep on going, okay? Now the thing is, let's see how many, so each of these are actually a call, right? Right, a function call. So how many calls are made in total? So let's see from here, you see that, uh, if you carefully notice here, you see when I am actually coming down this path, right? From Fn, I'm coming to Fn minus one, n minus two, n minus three. So that means until I reach say F one or F zero, I there will be like length of n. So the path length is going to be n. Okay. So you see that. And that, from the other side, you see that uh, from from Fn it becomes n minus two, then n minus four, then n minus six. So every time it's uh, reducing by two, that means uh, when it actually will go all the way down to the leaf, the uh, height is going to be n over two because every time it's getting reduced by two. And also you can see that this one is actually, if we draw these function calls, this one is actually looks like a binary tree. So a binary tree of, of height n, right? A binary of height n will have like two to the power n nodes. So this is the number of nodes in this tree. Okay, so order of two to the power n, which is exponential. And each of these nodes is actually a function call. That means there'll be exponential number of function call. So you see the runtime is going to be exponential because on this side, it will go to n a step deep, right? On this side, it will go to n over two step deep. And not only that, we are, uh, if you notice carefully, we are actually solving the same problems again and again. Let's see how many times we are solving, say, this one, Fibonacci of n minus three. You see, we are solving it here, we are solving it here, we are solving it here like three times, right? How many times we are solving Fibonacci of n minus five, we are solving it here, we are solving it here two times and three times, right? And then another one, say Fibonacci of four, we are solving here one, two, three, four times, right? So we're actually solving this problem, like these sub problems again and again. And so, and, Ultimately, these 
f n is turning into a exponential runtime problem. So if we think carefully, actually we had just n problems. So we had f Fibonacci of n, Fibonacci of f n minus one, and coming all the way down to Fibonacci of one, Fibonacci of zero, right? So we had like n problems, but we are solving the same problem again and again, and now making it exponential. So is there a way that instead of just solving the same problems and again and again and again, we solve them just once and keep the results somewhere? And next time, so say I solve it here, okay? Next time when I will reach here, I won't solve it. I will just use the result from here. Or I reach here, I won't solve it again. I will just use the result from here. Okay, can we do that? So that technique is called dynamic programming. In the next section, we'll talk about dynamic programming. Thank you. Let's talk about dynamic programming. So this is an algorithm de design technique. This is not a data structure or algorithm. It's, this is just a des algorithm design technique to cleverly design your recursive algorithms. So you can apply this technique to solve the problems that have, we call it optimal substructure property or recursive property, okay? So if the problem can be uh, defined as a recursive problem, that's one thing. And the second thing is overlapping subproblem. That means if you are solving overlapping, what does it mean? That means if you are solving the same problem again and again. So the idea is, do not repeatedly solve the same subproblem, but solve them only once and store the solutions in a dynamic programming table and then use it. Say, if I was like solving Fibonacci number of say F5, you saw that we are solving F3, F4, F2, right? Each of these problems, we are solving each of these problems multiple times. But why don't we just solve this once each of these problems once and then store the results somewhere and then use it. Okay, so that's the idea of the dynamic program. So two things. First of all, it has to have an optimal substructure. That means the problem can be defined re uh, using recursion. And the second one is overlapping subproblem. That means if you are solving the same thing again and again, if we have over overlapping problems that we are solving, we just want to solve them once and then use the result later, okay? So if, okay. So for example, let's go back to the Fibonacci number again. Let's make it one. So this was the problem, this was the number, right? So you see that we already were, we already were defining the problem as a recursive problem, right? So this was the problem, this function, this was the problem, which gives us the, this function gives us the Fibonacci. So this was the Fibonacci problem, right? So we say that if we want the Fibonacci of n, we can break it down into again calling Fibonacci on n minus one and Fibonacci of n minus two, right? Okay, so that means this problem actually breaks down into smaller problem of, of the same problem. So the first dynamic programming condition or hallmark is is uh, met, okay? That, that That's the first one. We said like to solve, uh, to apply the dynamic programming technique, uh, there are two conditions. So the first condition is met. And the second one, uh, you see, we have to have like uh, overlapping sub problems. So now you see these colored ones, right? Both of them are actually the same sub problems. It, it is trying to find f n minus three, right? So, so the second uh, condition is also met. Okay, so overlapping sub problem is also met. So instead of just, you see, we have like, we can have order of exponential number of problems, right? So say if they are like, someone say told you to do F10, to do our 10 is like, how much is 100, 1048 or something. So you have to call like Fibonacci function thousand, more than thousand times, you see that? 
if you are following this instead we only had like 10 problems it was like f10 f9 we just had 10 problems instead we are just calling each of these like hundreds of times and in total like if we just expand this tree like there will be like around more than thousand times we'll be calling the fibonacci just to get f10 instead why don't we make a way that we just call them 10 times and done okay so you see we only we had like actually we had just 10 problems but if we don't use dynamic programming we're just calling these problems more than thousand times okay so two there are two variants of dynamic programming one is the bottom up this is the bottom up dynamic programming well sometimes this is just plainly called dynamic programming. So if someone tells you that, hey, I am solving this problem using dynamic programming, it's most likely that he is using the bottom-up dynamic programming. And the other uh, variant is mem memoization, okay? So memoization is, uh, although it's not the same thing, but you can remember it like memo, memorization kind of thing so you just memorize the results right but actually it's, it's a different thing but you can just just to remember so you keep some memory and then use it later so there are two techniques bottom up and memorization okay so this is the bottom up technique let's let's solve uh, these fibonacci problem so the fibonacci problem was say the fibonacci problem was like this fn so we say like if n equals to zero or n equals to one, we turn one, right? We say like zero Fibonacci and n Fibonacci is one. Else return if n minus one plus if n minus two. This was a recursive solution, right? The super inefficient solution. Now let's try to solve it uh, using dynamic programming. So in the dynamic programming, this is the function for the Fibonacci bottom-up dynamic programming. You give the same number n, you initialize with the base cases. We already know this, right? Yeah, we also had done this here. But the thing is, instead of just calling it again and again, what you can do is we can just run a for loop from two to n. And basically we are actually keeping a memory. You see, we are keeping a memory and our target is getting this value, right? This is, so this is a memory of size N. Each of these is having like, this is the zeroth Fibonacci number. This is the nth Fibonacci number. The, our target is getting this. So bottom up means we start from bottom and then keep on building. And then once we come here, we get the up value. Okay, yeah, once I came here, we get the up value. Hi, uh, so yes, I'm back. Uh, okay, so in the bottom-up approach, what we do is, uh, yeah, so we first define the base cases and then we run a, just a run a for loop. And you see, it's, it's very easy if I have run a for loop, right? So uh, every time I just add, uh, the previous two values right we add them and then assign it to the next value so i add these two and assign it to this value so i keep on doing this until i reach here so from bottom i keep up building and finally once i reach here i just return this value right so what is the space complexity you see we have a space or we have reserved a space of uh size n uh, so this is space complexity is order of n and how many times we are running this for loop well n times or n minus one times but it's still like it's order of n so we can actually reduce this space complexity to order of one uh, this is your homework like how can you rewrite this problem 
uh, using just order of one. Order of one means constant space. This is your thing to solve at home. It's, it's, it's easy. You can just think about it. Uh, one clue is like, do I have to keep all of these in the memory or I can reuse them? Okay. Okay. So this is the bottom up approach. Now let's talk about the second approach. How the second way of doing uh, solving this same problem. And we say the second way is memoization. So in the memoization, what we do, you see in the bottom-up approach, we didn't call, do any recursive thing, right? We just uh, had a memory and we, so in the bottom-up approach, basically we are some, building some table, building it a solution table, right? This is very simple. So once you see the uh, bottom-up approach, it always looks very nice, elegant, and easy, although sometimes it's challenging to find it. But in the memoization technique, uh, we keep the recursive way of solving intact. In a, and also what we do is we uh, keep a memory, like suppose we keep a memory of size n, Right, so zero to n, and then in between the recursive calls, we fill up this memory. So suppose in our case, the memory is like we call it a f. In we initialize everything with null, so everything with null. So this is the function. Uh, this is the Fibonacci memoization function or procedure. So initially we have a memory of size n, we assign null to it, and then we call a helper function. Uh, this is a recursive function. And there we pass two things, n, because we want the nth uh, Fibonacci number, and then we also pass this memory, this one also we pass in the function, right? So what this function is going to do is this function is going to fill these values up. And once it fills these things up, I will return. Finally, I will get the final value here and return it, OK? So these n's are actually null, not to confuse with n itself. These are actually null. OK, so let's see what the recursive call does. So the recursive call, what it does is, obviously, once you go into the recursive call, so someone says, okay, uh, suppose that some at some point the recursive call is F3. So it will go to here and check if the value is all still null. If the value is null, it will do something. But if the value is not null, it will won't do anything. It will just return the result. So it will first check. So this is the recursive function, it will first check if fn is null. If n, if fn is null, then it will check if the value of n is zero, then it will assign zero. If the value of n is one, it will assign one, okay? Otherwise, it will just call the recursive function, you see, it will call uh, Fibonacci of n minus one and Fibonacci function of n minus two and add them up. After adding them up, it will store them in Fn. Okay, it will store them in Fn and it will return Fn. So for example, suppose uh, F3 was called and this third position was still null. So it will, it went inside, it checked if n is equals to zero, no, right? So it doesn't do this line or this line. What it did is, it did something like this. F3 equals to the Fibonacci function of n minus two, that is two. And also passed this memory, this memory array, plus Fibonacci of three, 
and pass this memory array. Okay. And you know, finally, what is returned, right? This was one, one, two. So three. The third Fibonacci number is actually three. So finally, this would have returned three into it, right? So the value would have been like three. Next time when F3 is called somewhere, like if if some if sorry, not F3, if Fibonacci 3 is called somewhere. It will go inside and check, oh, if this third place value is zero, it's not, sorry, if it's null, it's not. So it doesn't do any of these things, right? Because this is not null. It just will directly go and check and return this value. Wow. You see that? It doesn't make the recursive calls anymore. Okay. So that means I am solving the F3 ones only once now. So if I go back to our slide, so suppose this one was called at one point. Next time when this is called, already this value is like, we have this value somewhere in the memory. So we don't make any further calls. We are done here. We just return the value. That means everything that went beyond this is no longer done. We are saving on it. Okay. So is this is a this is a memorization technique. Okay, so let's talk about another problem. Uh, this is a very uh, it's a nice problem to so show uh, the dynamic programming. This is a little bit uh, it needs a little bit more thought. Like Fibonacci was very common and we all know about it. And so the example using the Fibonacci actually gave you, will give you a very good basic idea of how to convert a recursive uh, problem and solve it using dynamic programming. Now this one actually is a little bit more challenging, but it will actually solidify your, uh, uh, your concept about dynamic programming. Okay, so first, what is longest common subsequence? What is longest common subsequence? Okay. So we are given two sequences. So we call them X and Y. Uh, the sequence length of X is M and the sequence length of Y is N. We have to find the longest common subsequence. So here is X. Uh, X is A, B, C, B, D, A, B. This is X. Say this has a length of M. So this is the mth character. This is the first character. The second sequence is Y. B, D, C, A, B, A. The first character is B. The last character is A. Nth character. So the sequence means you know, uh, so suppose a, a sequence for this is like B, B, D is a sequence, okay? Because they come sequentially, right? They don't need to be, be contiguous. They don't need to sit uh, beside one another, but you have to just maintain the sequence. That means these come, so suppose A, B, D is another sequence, right? So we have to find the common sequence between these two and the longest one. As you see, like this one is a sequence, itself is a sequence, right? A, B is a sequence. Here, A, B is also a sequence. So these two are common, but we have to find the longest one. So by these red marks, you can see B, C, B, A. This is a sequence, right? And this same sequence is also here, B, C, B, A. And this is the longest common sequence between these two, between these two, right? So we have to find the longest common sequence between X and Y, and that is B, C, B, A. So how can we solve this problem? Now let's try a naive way to solve this. 
uh, just by simply saying like, if we can find all the sequences of X, all sequences of X, and also all sequences of Y, and then do a match between them, that will solve our problem, right? Uh -huh. So how can we find the all sequences of X? Well, let me show you how I can solve all sequences of X. Let's make it a random sequence. A, C, F, A, D, E. I want to find all the sequences of this. So what you can do is you can think it as a bit. So either I take this or leave this. So let's say 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. This means this sequence is actually A and D. Only A and D are included. Everything else is excluded. Another sequence might be 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. So this sequence is A and then F and then A, right? This is another sequence. Okay, so I, I am showing these bits just to show you that either I can either I can take this, either I can take this or leave this, right? So I have two choices. So how many sequences I can build in total? So if I have two choices here, I have two choices here, two choices here, two choices here. If I have like N of them, So in total, if I have say n of these, if I have n characters, so in total there are like two to the power n. So there are like two to the power n choices or combinations I can make, right? I showed you some of the combinations. One combination might be, my choice might be, I am taking all of them. So this itself is a sequence, right? This itself is the sequence. Or another choice might be, I showed you like, it might be zero, 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 zero zero one right it's just f so every character i can either take it or leave it in the sequence so there are two choices and if they're like n characters in total i can make true to the bar n right okay okay so let's go back and check this okay so to do our n sequences, so I can create to do our m sequences here, and two to the power n sequences here, and then match between these two to the power m and two to the power n sequences to a match. Now you see that creating the sequences itself is this is like exponential. This is exponential, right? And then we match these two to the power m sequences again as these two to the power n sequences. How many matches we have to do? Like there are like two to our m into two to our n sequences. It's these number of matches, right? This is like extremely inefficient algorithm. If I if my sequence have say hundred numbers, my program can never run this. So that would be two to our hundred plus say the smallest sequence even might be 50. So you cannot actually even do this. Okay, so how can we actually solve this? Can we use dynamic programming? So this is the brute force method, very inefficient. Okay, so let's try to find a better algorithm for this. So let's give you one pattern, say Argentina. And Apple, okay. So let's say this one uh, is defined by say X and the indices are defined by I up to say anything up to M. And this one is defined by Y and the indices are defined by J up to N. Okay. So now see if at any position, say at the first position, you say, these two actually match. If these two match, 
can we do this? Can we say now the longest common subsequence of X and Y started from index I and J can be, we say, you see that we already found one sequence. So can we delete these two and keep the rest and then say, we already got one match. So the match was, here was the match. We got A, A, right? Let's write it properly. So we got A, A matched. And then we just now care about finding the, we just now care about finding the highest, longest common subsequence in these portion, right? Now, now the my problem becomes smaller. I already found one match. So can I say longest common subsequence of say x, y, and the indices are now like i plus one and j plus one. Right? We can easily say that. But if there was a mismatch, let's say I give you another one. Say Germany and Bangladesh. I want to get the longest common subsequence. Germany is also represented by X and Bangladesh is represented by Y. So initially you see that the I position, this and this doesn't match, right? It's a mismatch. So can I say that for this case, the second case, the LCS of X, Y, I, J, well, we matched position I and J, nothing happened. So can I now shift my problem to, someone tells you, okay, uh, the first one didn't match, okay, find the longest common subsequence between this portion, Bangladesh to Germany, right? Because there was a mismatch. Probably we'll get a better match here. Or you can try to find the match between Germany and Bangladesh, right? Can I say that? So whichever suits you the best. So can I say it's a max of LCS, X, Y, the same string, but one of them will actually go to the next index, index or LCS of X, Y. I will take the whole of X, but I will, re I will start at J plus one index in the Y. Can I say that? So does it make sense? Okay, so there are two cases. If there is a match, so if x i equals to equals to y j, then this is the case. There is a match, so we just eliminate them and make the problem smaller. Now this is the smaller problem, right? This is the smaller problem. And since there was a match, I add one. Already we got one match. But if there is a mismatch, I just remove either the x, uh, sorry, i element from x or j element from j and then make the problem smaller. Even in this case, the problem becomes smaller. You see now the problem becomes like this, right? So it becomes like this. Or it would have been like, we could just retain the b and remove the g and make the problem like this, right? Okay, so this is the recursive formulation. If xi equals to yj, then the LCS of this becomes, we just increase the index by one and add one because there is one match. Else the LCS becomes the max of, we remove one character from x and take the whole of y. That is here, the first one or we remove one character from y and take the whole of x, 
that's the second one and we take the max because we want the longest one right okay so you see now that the bigger problem is now represented by a smaller problem of the same problem it's really you are looking the longest common subsequence problem but in a shorter sequence right so the larger problem is broken down into smaller problems so what does it say so this is the recursive formulation so we have formally done the recursive formulation so the first hallmark of dynamic programming is met okay now the next one so this is a recursive algorithm for the dynamic programming you see if any of the strings are like empty that means there is nothing in any of the string so if any of the strings are empty in that case the subsequence length is also zero right if this is an empty string and then you have like a b c d what is the longest common subsequence between them nothing right empty so that means you return zero that's the base case else if there is a match you return one plus this or if they're like mismatch character mismatch you take uh, just one character off from either of them and take the max now let's look at this part this particular part if there is a mismatch what happens how the program tree looks like okay so let's say my i value is say four and j value is three that means uh the length of the sequence x length of sequence x is four and length of sequence y is three so, and there is say there's a mismatch okay so okay so let's say one of them are like three length one of them is four and there is a mismatch so if there is a mismatch what do i do i just uh, cut one character from this right and take the whole of other thing that is we now are solve, trying to solve the lcs of two four or i cut one character from this right i cut one character from this and make it like lcs of three three right and then what we do is we take the max of max of this and this right okay that's fine now these problems are even further broken down so say if there is a mismatch again here so we cut one character from two two becomes one and take the whole of the other one right or we cut one character from four this one becomes three and then the take the whole of other one right so this one is how the if i i'm just writing ij right how the tree will look like uh what is the height of the tree you see this one will actually end if one of them actually reach zero right if you go to the algorithm, you see either i and j reaches zero, right? So how do you reach zero? You are just reducing the values one every time. So how many steps you will need to reach like something like this, zero, one, or one, zero, something like this. So you have to just reduce, uh, keep on reducing it, right? So that means if m and n are here, you are every step you're reducing one 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 so in total to reach this point one zero or zero zero you have to go down m plus one steps and since this is a binary tree because every problem is getting divided into two smaller problems it will be order of two to power m plus n leaves and each of or two, sorry, two to our m plus n nodes. And each of these nodes is actually a LCS problem itself. So there are like exponential number of 
LCS calls, like right? So LC, each of these are like one of one call. So they are exponential number of calls. And as you see, we are actually solving the same problems also in different part of this tree. You see these two, three. This thing is I'm solving here. And then one, three is also being solved in different parts. So we are solving the same thing. So this is the same sub problem we're solving. So there goes the second hallmark, like overlapping sub problems, right? So the distinct LCS sub problems are all the pairs i, j. The number of such pairs for two strings of length m and n is only m n. So basically, you see these are the problem like three four three four. So we are exponential now. We have if I follow this tree, we have exponential number of problems. But in reality, we only had like LCS of three four. Then we had like two, four, then we had, so if they're like M of, if the value of M is three and the N is four, how many pairs we can make like this? How many pairs we can make is three into four, right? That's actually 12 problems here. Instead of that, so actually there are only 12 problems, 12 pairs here. But if I am trying to draw the, Three, in that case, two to the power four plus three, two to the power seven. So this becomes like solving two to the power seven problems. Instead, we could just solve 12 problems and save them somewhere, right? So we could just solve like three, four, and then three, three, then three, two, three, one, right? Something like that, three, zero, and then two, four, we could just solve all these 12 or if you include zero, like the 16, instead of solving the problem to the power seven times, exponential times. Okay, so here comes the memoization. So that means we can solve this problem. So we can solve this problem and save the result somewhere. So there comes the first technique of dynamic programming. So we are keeping a memory here, LCS. Okay. So you see, initially every value is like set to null. So you're checking if the value is null, then we check if they are like, if any of the indices have become zero, that means nothing is left. In that case, we assign zero to that memory. Or if they match, we call the LCS again, add one to it. We call LCS again by increasing the index. We already have talked about it, how it, this comes and save the result in the our memory, you see? Or if there is a mismatch, we call LCS twice with removing one character either from the first one or the second one, take the max value and save it in the memory. Okay, and finally, we return this value. Okay, so that means if there is a like LCS of say three, four, and if LCS of three, four is still null. Then we go inside, you see I is not zero, J is not zero. So this part is not going to happen. If this is the case, like if, if this is a match, then we actually solve this LCS of three, four problem and, so, and save it in LCS three, four. Next time, if LCS three, four problem comes again, like somewhere else, right? Now this time you'll see that this portion is no longer null, right? So this is no longer null. So it will directly go here. It will directly go here and return LCS three, four. Okay. 
So we are actually cutting a lot of work. We are just solving each sub problem just once. And what is the space for this? Just this memory, keeping this memory. How much is, uh, how much space does this memory take? Is the length of x, which is m, and length of y. So the LCS table looks like this. So this is the LCS memory table. It has m say columns or an n rows. Okay, so they are like it's m into m space just to maintain this memory. So this is the memorization technique. Let's talk about the second way of dynamic programming, the bottom-up dynamic programming algorithm. We have these two sequences, x and y. And the, say the length of x is m, and the length of y is n. Okay, so we need a memory table of size m into n, right? So we can define it as a, like, uh, so the index here goes from index zero to m and here the index goes from 0 to n right so you see here uh, you can see two things like there are like m plus one uh, columns and n plus one rows why are we actually keeping one extra the first place is for an empty string okay so let's take a closer look. Uh, we'll describe that. And then let's talk about these, each of these cells. Say this cell is, if I say my memory array is defined as C, it's N plus one, N plus one. This is my memory array and any place, so this is, and uh, the second row and one, two, three, four, five, six, sixth column. Okay, second row, sixth column. So what does it signify? So it signifies this and this. So this signifies what is the LCS value of A, B, C, B. D and from here is B. Okay, so this location, this cell value it will define the LCS longest common subsequence between these two substrings. So we need for any recursive problem, we need a base case, right? So the base case we said is an empty string on the first one we say like it's an empty string. And if I take a LCS of an empty string, so it's empty, and then again is B, D, whatever it is like, right? So LCS of, first of all, LCS of empty and empty is going to be zero. We know that, right? Okay, what about LCS of empty against B? It's also going to be zero. If I change it to BD, still it's going to be zero, right? So everything is going to be zero here. Okay, done. Similarly, if I take a LCS of say, uh, against AB with empty that's zero right if i say a b c with empty that's also zero so similarly this is also going to be zero okay so we can actually fill the first row <coughs> it means we're comparing this again as the empty string and the the longest common subsequence between them is zero similarly we are May trying to find the longest common subsequence between empty string and B, D, C, A, B, A, right? It also is zero. Now the case here. 
So this location will mean I'm trying to find the LCS between A, right, and B. So how can I find that? So now it depends on two things. In this location, I will try to compare between this character and this character, right? So if they match, if they match, say, let's take another location. So this location, or let's say take this location. Okay. So this location actually defines the LCS between A, B, C, B. and B, D, C, A, B. Okay. Now you see that these, these character actually matches. These character matches. So that means this one matches. Now, can I say that if this character matches, I just want, I can, reduce the problem to A, B, C. So I, I remove this and remove this, B, D, C, A, plus one, because there was a match, right? Okay, so where is this location? Where is this location? Can I say that this location is A, B, C, and B, D, C, A. So this is this location. Can I say that? Okay. So can I say that if there is a match, if there is a correct like match, what I am going to do is I am just going to go diagonally up and add one. That's clear, right? Okay. That there goes one, one one definition what if there is a match how can i fill the fill the location up okay so i actually everything got removed so these were like zero let's look at a mismatch say this position so this or or let's take this position it's a mismatch here right so this position is actually lcs of abc and BD, right? ABC and BD. So if this, since there is a mismatch, can I say this is the max of LCS of ABC and I remove one character B, or I take the LCS of A, B, so I, I remove one character and B, D, right? And I take a maximum of it. Since these two characters don't match, so my longest common subsequence is either the longest common subsequence of all of myself and part of the other one, one less character, or Part of myself like removing the last character and the whole of other one right so where where are these two where are these two locations so you see a b and b d this one is here and this one like a b c and b this one is here right so can i say if there is a mismatch i just go up and left and take the max Okay, so if I do that, I can now formally define it. If there is a match of characters, I just go diagonally up, right? I don't go diagonally up and add one, right? And if there is a mismatch, that is the else, otherwise, I go up and left and take the max. Okay, so I go up. I go left and take the max between them. So this way, let's try to uh, fill this up.
Okay, so let's try to fill this up. So first the base case, the base case we define that everything becomes, so we take a memory of size uh, one plus n and one plus m, right? The zeroth location is for empty, uh, for empty string. So the LCS with an empty string is always zero. We take zero, that is fine. So this is our base case. And now let's try to fill this up. You see A and B, they don't match, right? So we go left and top and take the max of them, right? So the max of them is zero. Then B and B, they match. So we go diagonally and add one. Then C and B don't match. So we go left, we get top and take the max which is one. B and B match again. So we go diagonally and add one. D and B, they don't match. So we go left, we get top and take the max. B and A, they don't match. So we go left, we get go top and take the max. B and B matches. So we go diagonally and add one, okay? Next, A and D, they don't match. So we go left, we go top, and take the max. B and D don't match, so we take the max of top and left, so that is one. C and D, they don't match. So I take the max of one and one, which is one. B and D don't match. I take the max of one and one, that's one. D and D matches. So I go diagonally up, add one, so it becomes two, okay? Okay, so if I keep on doing this, ultimately this is going to look like this. The arrows here actually show where the value is coming from. Uh, so what is the time complexity of this algorithm? Order of MN, because we are actually filling up a, uh, say, filling up a, an array of size, say, m plus n, okay? And the space complexity, the space complexity is also order of m and n. So you see this is, this 2D array is of size m plus n, right? And, sorry, the space complexity is going to be order of Mn. I made a mistake. So the time complexity is also order of Mn because in total this has like m columns and n rows. So m into n cells, right? So we are doing one calculation to fill up each cell. So the time complexity is order of Mn. The space complexity is also order of Mn. And how do I find the uh, longest common subsequence? So these value finally gives me the longest common subsequence between these two strings right and how do i find the what is the longest common subsequence so we just follow the arrow and see where the changes happened value changes happened you see the value change happened once here and then it happened here and then it happened here and happened here that means this one b d a and B. This is the longest common subsequence here from this side, B, D, A, and B, right? Whenever there was a match, there was a value change. So this is shown with color codes here. And then as we said, the space complexity is order of MN. Uh, now exercise for everyone, or we will try to show it. We can actually reduce the space to order of minimum of M and M. So this is an exercise for you. I am just giving you a clue. I don't need to uh, maintain this whole, uh, maintain this whole table. Just think about this. When I was filling up this portion, the only thing I needed was this part, right? I got all the values from this part. 
right? The same thing is for the next row. So when I'm filling up this portion, I get all the values from only the previous row. So why don't I just keep this much memory and keep on reusing it to calculate because the my final target is this, right? If just I want to get the length, right? If I want to get this whole thing, probably I need to save everything. But if I just want to take the length, why don't I just keep this amount of memory and reuse it? So this is an exercise for everyone. Uh, so thanks for watching and we'll come back with another video.